I've had enough with Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, and all the other streaming services. They're raising prices, putting in ads, and even deleting content that people already paid for. I have altered the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. This deal's getting worse all the time. I'm not sailing the seven seas, so in my last video I showed you how I rip movies to my computer. In this video, I'll show you how I organize my media library using a program called Jellyfin. But first, I need to clear up a few things. I want to talk about the why. After all, you could pay for years of streaming for the price of an ass. Well, remember when Netflix was new? Back then, cable had the best content. Over-the-air TV was gutted, and most sports and high-budget shows were only on cable. And they made you pay up. Cable and satellite were like a hundred bucks a month, and they'd stuff the plans people actually wanted with dumb channels nobody even watched. The same thing's happening now with streaming services. They've become the very thing they were meant to destroy. But at least back then, we still had Blockbuster. I could go grab almost any movie, game, or TV series and watch it on my DVD player. Today, there's really no alternative, except for physical media. And yeah, there are some sacrifices you have to make. If you're not subscribed, you might have to wait for a popular show to make it to Blu-ray. But here's the thing. If a show's good enough to make it to Blu-ray, it's good enough for me to wait for it. Heck, patience? <laughs> that used to be a virtue. Worst case, if I gotta watch it now, I can subscribe for a month, binge the show, and cancel. But not having easy access to a huge amount of streaming content has an unintended benefit. I can be intentional about the things I do watch, which is good. It's hard enough keeping my YouTube and social media habits in check, and Netflix today has a deep library, but of shallow content. And that's the trend for all the other streaming services too. Also, since I own physical copies of all my media, companies like Amazon and Time Warner can't take it away like they do on their own platforms. Well, unless they convince the FBI to do a raid on my properties, I wouldn't put it past them. But there are some other things people were also worried about in the last video. I got a lot of comments about how paying 30 bucks per movie is a huge waste of money compared to streaming services. Well, yeah, I have over 300 movies. If I paid 30 bucks for each one, that'd be $9,000 just for the movies I own. That'd pay for 90 years of streaming services even if I subscribed to every single one. But I didn't pay 30 bucks a movie, not even close. I bought most of them on eBay, and other ones from the bargain bin at Walmart, Goodwill, or even at garage sales. Most movies, even pretty new Blu-rays, are less than five bucks. And DVDs? You can get them for one or two bucks. TV seasons cost more, but you gotta be kidding if you think I'd ever pay over a hundred bucks for a box set of anything. You can buy individual seasons of almost any show on eBay for a few bucks each. But to do this, you have to be patient. If you really want to watch something right at its release, you might have to pay more, which is why I pre-ordered Top Gun Maverick. Once every few years, a movie's good enough that I will pay full price. But for everything else, it takes time before you can buy at a discount. But that's okay because most shows today are hot garbage. And the few that aren't, well, they'll be just as good six months after release. Not everyone agrees, but that's okay. It's good for engagement, so please comment about how I'm doing the wrong things down below. And like and subscribe while you're at it. Speaking of comments, I got a lot about how breaking DRM is illegal. Well, I'm not a lawyer, but here's what I'll say. First of all, the law is different in every country around the world, and greedy Hollywood execs try to make it impossible to legally watch movies how and where you want, wherever you live. But here in the US, we have the DMCA, and it has some text covering the process of copying movies off physical discs. And technically, it still has a provision banning the breaking of DRM, or as it calls them, TPMs, or Technical Protection Measures, in most cases. It's stupid, but it's the law. But besides the fact that Hollywood is shooting themselves in the foot by incentivizing people to pirate content like it's 1999, there are exceptions for remixes. Basically, videos like mine that provide commentary or use the footage for educational purposes. So, if you just film yourself doing something illegal and post it on YouTube, it kinda sorta makes it legal, I guess. I mean, if someone from Hollywood sees this and would like to sue, hey, be my guest. Maybe I could team up with the EFF and finally get this dumb loophole fixed once and for all. Amazon can go in and delete TV shows people legally bought. If that's legal, but backing up my own Blu-ray isn't, Maybe it's the law that needs changing. A few people also had gripes about my transcoding process. Yes, I can do live transcoding. Asa Store even told me after that video that all the NASAs I've shown can do live transcoding without any issues, even at 4K. I still don't do it, but for most people you can probably just skip the handbrake part as long as you have enough drive space. 
Speaking of handbrake, I got a lot of comments about using 30 FPS, but that setting is a maximum, not an absolute. I can show you here, when I open the War Games movie that I transcoded, the actual frame rate is 23.98 frames per second. So please, stop getting all worked up about it. Or find some other setting to nitpick. Like I said, YouTube loves the engagement. There were a few other interesting things I learned from your comments, like VLC alternatives like IINA, MPV, and Pot Player. I also heard from many people who use tools like ARM, the automatic ripping machine, to speed up the process. But enough of that, let's get back to the topic of this video, managing your media library. After you rip a bunch of movies and TV shows, what do you do with them? In my last video, I mentioned you could start with an external hard drive, but eventually, most people get a NAS, or Network Attached Storage. It provides redundancy, but it's not a backup. See my video on backups for why. But more importantly, it's the easiest way to share your media with your whole house. This NAS is called the DriveStore 4 Pro, but companies like Asusstore, Synology, and QNAP have a lot of different options, costing anywhere from a couple hundred to a couple thousand bucks. This video isn't sponsored like the last one, but I will mention Asusstore sent this NAS to me a long time ago. This video isn't an endorsement or review, I'm just using this NAS since I have it on hand. The first thing to do is set up your NAS. I have four Seagate hard drives and they come packed in these anti-static bags. Pop them out of the bags, pop them in the drive trays, and slide the drive trays into the box. For most NASs, it's just that easy. For some, you have to do a little extra assembly work. But once you have it all plugged in, with power and network at least, you have to find the NAS on your network. Turn on the NAS and wait for it to boot. On this NAS, it has a loud beep that sounds once it's all ready. Your user's guide should guide you through finding your NAS on the network. For this one, you can download Asus Store's Control Center, but for me, since I don't want to install extra software, I just ran this command that finds all Asus devices on the network. I grabbed the IP address and went to it on the default port 8001. For this NAS, it has what's called a self-signed security certificate, so when you visit it the first time, your browser will probably pop up a warning like this. Just ignore it and visit the site anyways. This should bring up the setup wizard. For me, I'm going to stick with the default balanced hard drive setup that builds a RAID 5 array. It's a good option on this NAS, but look for other videos if you want a better explanation of RAID and how all that works. Asus Store wants me to register my NAS, but I'm just using it in my home and I don't need any of their extra services, so I'm just going to ignore that. I'll also ignore this update for now, but it's a good idea to keep your NAS up to date so it's more secure. I log in about once a month and make sure any updates are installed. If I go into Storage Manager, I can see the hard drives are doing something called synchronizing. This process is a one-time thing, and it takes a day or two depending on how big your drives are, but you can still use the NAS while it's synchronizing, it'll just be a little bit slower. So while it's doing that, I'm going to hop over to App Central and install Jellyfin. And when I do that, Asus Store is telling me it will also install Docker, create a media folder, and set up some other services. That looks good to me, so I'll let it install. You don't need a NAS to run Jellyfin, it'll run fine on almost any computer, heck, even a little Raspberry Pi like this one. But I'm just showing how I set it up on a NAS because that's probably the easiest way. Once it's installed, if I go over to File Explorer, I can see there's a new media directory on the NAS, and that's where I should put all my movies and TV shows for Jellyfin to see them. To put my movies on the NAS, I went into Services and made sure SMB file sharing was enabled. I need that so I can mount the NAS on my computer and copy my movies to it. And you should also set up a user account with permission to mount the media folder. I'll go into Access Control and add a new user. The most important thing is to make sure this user has read-write access to the media folder. All the other settings are okay, so I'll create the user. The media folder is empty right now, but I'm going to head over to my Mac where I have the three movies I ripped. I could browse to the server on the network, but since I know its IP address already, I'll just use my Mac's Connect to Server option and type in the address here with SMB before it. When I connect, I enter the media username and password I just set up, then I can mount the media folder. And it's empty right now, but I'll copy over the three movies that I ripped earlier. A few moments later. Now that the movies are on the NAS, I can see that they appear in the NAS's interface too. So now I need to set up Jellyfin using its quick start. First, I set up the admin user account. Then when I went to create a media library, I realized I should probably put the movies into a movies folder. So I jumped back over to File Explorer and did that. Then I went back and set up a movies library inside Jellyfin using the movies folder I just added to the media volume. I left all the other options default, but I did select the save artwork into media folders option because I like how easy it is to update things like cover art if Jellyfin picks the wrong one. Then I went through the rest of the setup and eventually it kicked me back to the login page. I logged in, 
And at first it says nothing here, because Jellyfin actually has to scan your library the first time you run it. And over in the admin dashboard, I can see the scanning progress. After that's done, we should be able to see all the movies I copied over. All right, it's just about finished, and if I go back over to File Explorer, you can see Jellyfin downloaded artwork, like cover art, a logo, and a backdrop, which it'll use when it displays the movies. And if I go back over to Jellyfin and go to the home, I should see my movie library. And if I click on it, I can see the three movies on the NAS. And if I click on one, like War Games, I can see all the data that Jellyfin pulled down for it. And if I want, I can hit play, and it should just start streaming the movie from the NAS down to my browser. Now, one thing I've learned after building up a library with hundreds of movies is it's nice to put each movie in its own folder. Otherwise, you'll get a directory with thousands of files and it's harder to organize, especially if you do things like rip extra features. So for each movie, I'm gonna create a folder with the same name as the movie, like War Games with 1983 in parentheses. And when I do that, if I move the artwork inside the folder with the movie, I have to remove the prefix from each of the artwork files. But note that you also have to change the poster file to be named folder but it's even easier just to delete the artwork and let Jellyfin re-download it for you. I'll do that for Mulan 2 and then also for Mulan and then organize those two folders the same way. If I go back over to Jellyfin, I can manually rescan the libraries. After a few minutes, Jellyfin filled in the data for all the movies again, and if I go back into the UI, I can hop back to where I left off and watch my movies. So the next thing I wanna do is add a view only account. If I have my kids signed in on the TV upstairs, I don't want them to be able to delete movies or change any metadata. So in Jellyfin, I can go to the admin dashboard and add a new user under the users tab. I'll give this user access to all libraries and leave all the default options set up. There are more things you can change like parental controls, but I'll just leave that for now. You can see the viewer is now listed in the users tab, so I'm gonna open a separate private browsing tab and visit Jellyfin and log in as the viewer. It works, but if I go to the menu now, I can browse the library, but I can't get into that admin dashboard. And outside the web interface, Jellyfin makes a great app for the iPhone, iPad, or Android. You can use the official app or just open it up in your browser. But other apps work with Jellyfin too. On my Apple TV, I already had this app called Infuse, or as my kids call it, Nachos, since it looks like the Doritos logo. All I had to do was give it the connection details for Jellyfin, and it worked right away. There's also Swiftfin for Apple TV, but I haven't tried that yet. Other media apps like Libra Elect can even synchronize with Jellyfin if you want. Go check out my This Is Not A TV video for how I did that. Now, as you grow your media library, you'll also run into things like building up collections where there are multiple movies in a series like with Lord of the Rings. For that, I just have a movie each in its own folder inside of a Lord of the Rings folder like this. Those movies also have two parts per film and if you name them with part one and part two like this, then when you're in Jellyfin, it will show additional parts for the movie. I actually need to go back and rip all the extra features for those movies, I forgot to do that. For TV series, I have this example of Doctor Who, and my favorite Doctor was David Tennant, though I like the raw passion Christopher Eccleston brought to that first season. But we're getting off track here. You can see when I put the rips on my NAS, I added this TVDBID to the folder name here. For a series like Doctor Who, where there were multiple runs with the same name, you can add on a little extra metadata. That tells Jellyfin the specific series, so when it pulls down the information, it's all correct. Where did I learn how to do all this? <laughs> the documentation. There are all kinds of weird edge cases you might run into, and chances are someone's already spelled it out in there. Finally, in case the FBI does raid my home asking for proof I didn't download a car, I keep every disk I rip in these giant binders, and those go into storage. It's also helpful in case I do want to rip anything at a higher bitrate someday. This video barely scratches the surface. I only talked about a few of the main features of Jellyfin and how I organize movies and TV shows. I didn't even talk about things like books and music libraries, HD home run integration for recording TV like a TiVo or anything like that. The possibilities are endless once you control your own media library. And Hollywood hates it. Have you noticed they started not releasing content on physical media in the past few years? Yeah. If you could just go ahead and make sure you do that from now on, that would be great. If these streaming services want to survive and don't want to die off slowly like Dish Network, let's make them play in our court. Until then, piracy! No, <laughs> I mean, you do you, but I'm gonna own my own content now. Disney can't come into my house and take back the Blu-rays I bought. And the more I rip, the more I get to cosplay as a sysadmin, managing more and more hard drives. I see this as an absolute win. Exactly, Smart Hulk. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling. And I know you're gonna ask, so here's what it says. <laughs> Read it in a British accent.